Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. It's Sunday afternoon. It's 12.31. Thanks, Kev. And we are here, Kevin Graham and Colin Watt, two of my longest-serving Axom team members. We're here on a Sunday. We're here to talk about Celtic. Plenty to discuss. First and foremost, there has been an addition to the, the background. I felt it was looking a wee bit colourless. What do you reckon of the old Axom Celtic Greats top? It's a belter, eh? That Umbro top. Ah, it definitely is, eh? Can't wait to see you running about in it again, Paul. Yes, I know that you do enjoy that. Um, What other legends or greats, Kevin, have you seen running about in it? I'm not saying I'm one of them, but (laughs) how many? Because the first one that comes to my mind is Chalky. Remember Brian McClare came up to Oakley to play for us? Brian McClare was superb that day. Mm. Um, Obviously, he's in his 50s, but you can see still... He still had that touch, and he still he still kind of ran the midfield for at least ten minutes or something like that. Uh, we Simon Donnelly scored a great goal that day. He uh, did. A, a, a chip for the edge of the box. Eh? He did. I, I, mean, I mean, this show that we haven't got green green tinted specs on. Eh? Charlie Muller's been the best player in the park the twice I've watched it. The by greats. some distance, by some Kevin. Distance, man. Yeah, mm-hmm. by some distance. I mean, Alan. Yeah, thanks for reminding us, but we will go to confession for missing it. Um, <laughs> I think the big thing with me uh, with regards to Charlie Muller, I was at his first Ranger Celtic game. Kevin, you would have been there as well in the famous or infamous Hamden season and he ran the show, remember that? He ran Aye, the show, he was he 18, 18 years of age? Mm-hmm. And he looked to me, by the way, this isn't on the agenda, this is us just rapping, so I, I, I've got to apologise to anybody who's in the comments we do have a structure to today's show um, Yeah, Charlie Miller was brilliant that day, there was always that story that he, he was brought up in a kind of Celtic supporting family, I think his uncle was a big Celtic man, and Celtic had a chance to buy him Celtic had a chance to to bring him in and he was left at the reception area. Now, that reminds me, actually, somebody texted me during the week, a good pal of mine texted me during the week and said, oh, you should watch the the Graham Hunter interview with Graham Soonis, where Soonis talks about having an opportunity to sign for Celtic. Now, anyone who's read the Quality Street Gang, this isn't a shameless plug because you can't buy it anywhere. (laughs) Um, I did cover that because Kenny Dalgleish told me about that. Soonis was in there on a Tuesday and Thursday around about the same time as Danny McGrain, Kenny Dalglish, Billy Murdoch, the younger brother of Bobby. Uh, we never, we never signed him. He, he was waiting about reception. His dad came to get him one Tuesday or Thursday night, and the following day went down and signed for Spurs. And I remember saying to you, Kenny Dalglish, "Wow, what a missed opportunity!" But he was absolutely, absolutely to the contrary, Kevin. He said, "No, actually, he needed uh, a couple of failures in his career to become the player that he became at Liverpool." So it is interesting. I mean, Charlie Miller is absolutely superb, even to this day. After the game, you see him having a wee smoke at the side of the park and all that kind of stuff. That's maybe why he didn't uh, have the career he probably should have had. Uh, we will be talking about some Celtic players who might not have the careers they should have had, but for other reasons, Colin, because that's something we will touch touch on. But let's get a wee update on the manager situation. Now, we're not repeating ourselves. This is a, uh, a moving target, isn't it? Um, last week, we were talking about the information around Roy Keane. I think uh, Steve McGowan confirmed that Celtic had discussed the job with Roy Keane. It looks as though... If nothing else, we are going through the correct process, Kevin Graham, Uh, you know, because that was a big, uh, really a big criticism about uh, giving Neil Lennon the permanent job second time round, wasn't it? It was the biggest criticism. When it comes to anything that this PLC do, do, I always go back to the John Lydon's famous quote at the Winterland Gardens in San Francisco on the Sex Pistols' last ever live date before they reformed for the Filthy Lucra tour, when he told the audience, do you ever get the feeling that you're being cheated? And I sometimes feel like that with the Celtic PLC, with every decision-making process that they go through. I think what is clear to me is over the last week... If you're getting cheated, you've got to accept that you're getting cheated. You've got to accept that you're getting played. And you see it when we banned returning. I will get to my point eventually. Mm. Uh, you, see, you, see, you see it when banned returning for reunion tours and that. You know that they're only there for the money. And I sometimes think that this week especially, we're getting played. Us as a fan channel and other fan outlets are getting played with the rumours that are getting kicked about and the certain leaks getting done to the press from both sides. For, for me, it's extremely clear there's a split in the boardroom 
mm. of who wants to be the next Celtic manager. Right. There's a there's a side for Keen, and there's a side for anybody but Keen. Um, and we were, I think we were for me looking in, knowing where knowing where the our rumor about the Hark and Keen and Buck came from. I think it, think to me it was quite clear that that person doesn't want Roy Keen anywhere near Celtic Football Club, and that's why it was put out there. Now, Kevin, for, for me, that, that's how it was put out there. I think it's a great shout. It's a great shout. And before we go any further, I think the important thing is to say that a Celtic state of mind, that from time to time, you appreciate that someone is, is actually giving you information with an ulterior motive. And that's why it's so difficult sometimes to manage that, Kev. So I remember uh, days before mentioning it on the podcast, sending it out, and you came back to me and said that, didn't you? You said, mm-hmm. well, somebody in that boardroom wants to test the water uh, or wants Roy Keane blown out the water, um, which basically did happen. I mean, if you were to do it in terms of a popularity vote, Colin, I mean, I know Boyce jumped on the Roy Keane bus and I think he's he's maybe driving it. He's maybe driving the Roy Keane bus. Um, but the vast majority of Celtic fans that I've seen on the back of the podcast, on the back of the tweet, were no chance. I don't want to go near him. I think, and I, I'm not just saying this for effect, I, I probably could count on one hand the amount of... And this is a, obviously a tiny cross-section of the overall support, of course. On one hand, the amount of people that I've seen coming back saying, no, Roy Keane is the man for the job. I mean, it's interesting as you say. Boise kind of led the the bus. He's driving it. He built the bus. He's uh, he's stuck all this, the labels on the side of the bus for Roy Keane. Um At least it's not a Parks one. Well, at least the, I think he borrowed the uh, Boris's Brexit bus and just repainted it. Um, but no, no, I think most people are of the understanding that it's been ten years since Roy Keane was actually in a managerial role as a, a manager. Obviously, he's been a coach at the Republic Island at Nottingham Forest. He's worked under different managers, but everybody knows him as the pundit. He's Roy Keane, the pundit. He's not Roy Keane, the football coach. That that's what his levels at now. You, you kind of understand that he's given the coaching a try. It didn't really work for him, and then he found his place on the TV on a Sunday afternoon, sitting next to Mika Richards and having a go at guys like Jamie Carragher and Jamie Redknapp. He's found his place in football. That there's no place for him to come back out of that. He's been out it for far too long. The kind of attachment to Keane is this Irish sentimentality attachment at Celtic, and it's something that if we want to start a new era, then we have to completely move away from that. We have to start fresh. And that's why I think a lot of people are saying Keane is not the man for the job. On top of the fact that his last two managerial positions, he didn't do very well there either. He, everyone just wants this fresh start. Scott Brown's moving on. Um, Peter Lowell's moving on. We've not been at the grounds now for over a year. When we come back, this is a new era for Celtic. And Roy, Roy Keane can't be the man to lead us into that era. It is a new era, Colin, and the headline reads, Is the Celtic's biggest post-McCann rebuild? And I think... Kevin uh, probably mentioned this a wee while ago before we, we knew the extent of the changes, even just in terms of the the personnel on the field. And I was uh, likening it to the rebuild after the, the Dalglish and Barnes, and it was a massive rebuild back then. Now, I know uh, one of the projects one of the main projects you're involved with at the moment, Kevin, um, has resulted in you studying in great detail the, uh, the three big Irishmen that have been appointed by them at Desmond. I keep saying that Roy Keane is the itch that he needs to scratch. Um, I mean, it's divisive amongst the fan base. Do you think it's as divisive in the boardroom? Do you think the boardroom even have a voice? Because I've never heard it. Of course, uh, it looks divisive in the boardroom. You just all, uh, look, when, when Dermot Desmond stamped his feet, he, he brought us uh, Brendan Rogers, Martin O'Neill and Gordon Stratton. When he stamped his feet and got his way, that was the three managers that he's rumoured to have brought us. We can only say rumoured. Martin O'Neill is, is in stone, that is true. But the other ones, there's a bit of dubiety about it. Um, as you say, there is an, there, 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 there seems to be an itch there. Keane was a, a nail on to get the job in 2014 until mm-hmm. the outgoing CEO put a kibosh on it. And that seems to be happening again. If you actually have a look at Stephen McGowan's bit, Stephen McGowan was the was the journalist who revealed that Celtic have interviewed Roy Keane, and Stephen McGowan was the journalist who done a a piece slaughtering Roy Keane straight away. So we all know we all know McGowan's links to the outgoing CEO, and. It, it, 
if they think that we're buttoned up the back, we're not buttoned up the back. We can actually see what's getting played out here. But right. I agree with I agree with you, Paul. I think if Dermot Desmond wants Roy Keane, he'll get Roy Keane. We've been looking at all the different permutations of that scenario and I know that obviously as well as being on the, the Axon Bulletin on a daily basis, uh, we have our WhatsApp group which is um, a thriving wee group actually I've got to say uh, but you know Jim Orr says there's nothing you can do to kind of like uh, paint this picture or you know you can't polish a turd a lot of people say and I'm not calling Roy Keane a turd I wouldn't dream of that because if I ever meet him he might uh, <laughs> pick me up on it but um, you, we were looking at let's look at the, the three names that we mentioned last week Kevin Harkin, Keane and Butt it's interesting that of the three Keane's the one I've got my doubts about I mean looking at Nicky Butt you think well someone said again um, because his name is not as sexy as Enzo Maresca um, does that mean that we're not going to buy into it when, when you look at actually what he's developed at Manchester United the reputation he was building there um, is it really just a perception thing rather than based on the actual fibre of what he's done uh, at Manchester United over a prolonged period it could just be that Man United are not the dominant club in England and Man City are and have been for the apart from Liverpool's we and then in the last five years. Um again it's this it's perception. It is a perception thing. I completely agree with you. Nicky Butt has brung through a lot of the young players who are excelling in that Man United side. But mm-hmm. Man United but Man United are no sexy now, are they? They've got a a guy Oli Gully Solskjaer as their manager and rival fans call him a, a PE teacher. So they, ha- they haven't got Pep Guardiola standing there on the touchline and he's a thousand pound jumpers and 1200 quid cardigans and stuff like that. Eh? They've got a guy who looks like a PE teacher for Kez. So uh, it's, it's all down to perception. Nicky Butt's the same level as Maresca, except he's had a better playing career, a far better playing career, higher standard playing career. Is there a thing as well, when you look back on, I mean, obviously we look uh, quite deeply into crops uh, of players coming through all at the one time, and obviously we um, speak a lot about the Quality Street Gang, the Lisbon Lions, the Kelly Kids, but Manchester United had their own, didn't they? They had uh, Fergie's fledglings, uh, for the older amongst us, Colin, you might not remember them, but that was your Russell Beardsmore and all the kind of guys that came through. Lee Martin, who ended up at Celtic, was one of those players. And then you had uh, another wave of them coming through, which have become known as the Class of 92 and you'll have seen the documentary and all the rest of it one interesting thing not one of the guys has done anything in management and Nicky Bott was obviously part of that now I'm not just saying that because Gary Neville and Phil Neville are rotten managers that so is Nicky Bott but it is interesting that that whole crop of players um, quite a few of them have gone into management but none of them have really really uh, flown um, and, and done their own thing I don't I don't feel but no. in terms in terms of the actual roles as well you know Declan spoke about the, the roles of the, the DOF the, the manager stroke head coach and his assistant uh, but yeah that's totally understood we, we know what the role of Roy Keane would be we know what the role of his coaching staff would be and also of the director of football but the name that's come back in um, is obviously that of Eddie Howe. But again, is this a perception thing, Kevin? Because, you know, we had the privilege of having uh, Mark Cuse and Mark Bowen on a special Celtic State of Mind. It was great of the guys to join us. And when you looked at their, um, you know, record as managers, and this is a thing, people were saying that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm their agent and I'm trying to get them the job. But when you actually look at the, the, the record of the management teams, then that's what it needs to be based on. Because what I would say to you is, uh, one of the names Kevin mentioned before, Gordon Strachan. Now, we all know what Gordon Strachan done. Love or loathe his approach, his style of football, his, his some of his signings. Uh, you look at what he achieved at Celtic, and it was incredible. Three in a row, two last 16 finishes in the Champions League. Uh, peppered with a, with a few shockeroonies, it's got to be said. And the last season was a season too far, I think, Kev. But look at what he had done prior to coming to Celtic. He had only managed two games in Europe. Mm-hmm. for Southampton and that was virtue of being the runners up in the FA Cup final the previous season so often you know we are in a market where we're looking at managers who have you know we're not going to get uh, Rafa Benitez who's already won European trophies we're not going to get Roberto Martinez and I'll expand on that in a wee second we're not going to get that level of manager so when you're going to get someone like Gordon Strachan 
a lot of questions were raised at that time on some of the more antiquated uh, platforms that were available back then, Colin, such as fans' forums. Uh, but now, obviously, we've moved forward with technology and we're talking about it live on a Celtic state of mind. But I remember the reaction to Gordon Strachan getting the job. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I wouldn't have said it was an exciting reaction. And you look at his record and you look at what he had achieved with... You know, kind of uh, provincial clubs in the in the the nature of English football, Coventry City. You've seen what's happened since uh, the time it is t- striking Southampton. Yeah, there's some great things about Southampton in terms of their youth development, um, etc. And the players that they've produced over over the last twenty years has been incredible. But in- what Strachan had done with those clubs, you know, was nothing really to write home about. But he came to Celtic, and he, he was a he was a success. No one can really deny that. So the manager that we appoint right now. So this is why I'm getting round to Eddie Howe. Eddie Howe's success, people continually go on about, oh, but look how it ended. He doesn't want to move out of his, uh, his hometown and all this kind of stuff. Kevin, is he the closest to the Brendan Rodgers type appointment where he does have the fibre, but he also has that profile of the, the King the English, and I'm not going to use the word elite manager, but successful manager from the English League? He's got the very same sort of coaching type of background to Brendan Rodgers, how he's built up his career. The difference between Eddie Howe and Brendan Rodgers in terms of taking the job is whether we can disagree with it or not, the only reason Brendan Rodgers ended up at Celtic is because he did have a Celtic connection. Let's not... To try and convince somebody that hasn't got a Celtic background to come to Celtic at that level of management takes an awful lot of money. Um, and I know and I know, folk cast doubt on Brendan Rodgers' Celtic credentials, but I think there's a big factor that he ended up at Celtic because his family were Celtic fans. And he saw that as a perfect place. Now, we might benefit. How we might look at what Rodgers has done and go, I quite fancy going up there and doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, is a diff- this is a different type of project than going to a Newcastle or a Crystal Palace or something like that. Or he might just be in this mindset to go, I just want an English, I just want an English Premier League job. I'm mm-hmm. happy down the South Coast. Crystal Palace have got a decent youth set up. Roy Hodgson's going to leave in the summer. I'm going. I'm just going to go there. I'm just going to sit and wait on that job. You don't know, but it seems like the Celtic board are asking the questions of mm. candidates that they know that they can get. And what happens in the interview? What happens in the interview? We're never going to know what's happened. What happens in the interview? It could be that the, the interview, how the interview, Keane, the interview, Frank Lampard, the interview, Jim Duffy, for example, and Roy Keane's the, be- the, the best best candidate for the job. What odds, might, is, what, what odds is Jim Duffy at the moment? I'm, He's I'm now just to, came into 25 to 1 after Kev <laughs> saying that. I know, I can just see it on the three or four uh, Celtic blogs that obviously quote this channel quite regularly. Kevin Graham said, you know, the Jim Duffy <laughs> rumour is alive. Uh, you mentioned Roy Hodgson there. Obviously, Kev, you'll remember the Neuchatel Zamax fiasco <laughs> when Hodgson was in charge there. Do you know what his first... Uh, coaching appointment was do you know where it was I, I don't even think this exists on his Wikipedia page which by the way for anyone doing research you've got to go deeper than Wikipedia but I don't think it's on there do you know what his first coaching position was Kev no no enlighten us Paul enlighten us was it in Japan our broth Arbroath. Really? Arbroath, yes. Arbroath was his first ever coaching position. There you go. And he has, he's basically gone from, from Arbroath kind of downhill uh, to England, Liverpool, all that kind of stuff. Nusha tells Amax. But Kev, you've got a point to make. This is one for all the older people in the comments, but was his first coaching job driving that wee train that Arbroath used to have up and down the seafront? <laughs> Possibly, mate. But he's, he's come on leaps and bounds since then, let's be fair. But Colin I mean, has the, Colin hasn't got a clue. He's not got a clue. He's not got a clue. He's not got a clue. Right. Um, now, we all know, again, that, you know, we've got to do this in kind of, kind of, it's got to be in order. Uh, the whole thing's got to be done in order. So the CEO um, has announced that he's standing down. The manager is gone. Uh, we've announced the CEO's replacement in Dominic Mackay. What we would expect next, Kev, as a director of football, I think it's a, a kind of open secret that that's Fergal Harkin. Um, people are accepting that that is going to happen. In relation to the announcement, we would expect something within a couple of weeks. And obviously, this will result in 
Nicky Hammond leaving the, the club as well so Nicky Hammond will no longer be the head of recruitment but what I was saying again during the week there is that um, we're losing what you could describe as heads of department quite a few of them so you've lost the CEO you've lost the manager you've lost the head of recruitment and you're you're losing your captain that's massive and that's why I'm saying is the Celtic's biggest post-McCann rebuild it's not just about losing three or four pivotal players um, or influential players these are massive massive figures at the club leaders of various areas of the football uh, operation Kevin and I was saying during the week that I felt the Scott Brown announcement was a bridge too far I think I'm not saying on its own merits that Scott Brown's leaving will uh, make everything else crumble but when you think about all the other heads if you like all the other leaders that are leaving this club I think it's a massive massive error um, yeah, the Scott Brown situation. If I, if I speak about Nicky Hammond first, Nicky Hammond's going to take his contacts and his links and all of that with him. And you would hope if Fergal Harkin has been told he is getting the job and there's going to be a two week period, then he's already getting his team in place to actually come in. So it would be a quick transition. It's mm-hmm. not like it's not like two. Was it two summers ago? We bring we bring in Nicky Hammond on a six week contract and tell him mm-hmm. go and sign go and sign us some players. You, you would think that the uh, Fergal Harkin coming in as a director of football would be saying right if I'm coming in as a director of football I want, I want this guy this guy this guy and this guy that has to get done as soon as I come in. Mm-hmm. But then again we don't seem to work like that. That's that, I mean that's too forward thinking. That's too that's too out the box yeah. um, for us to actually plan that. Uh, that ahead, but maybe maybe Fergal Harkin's planning that far ahead. Maybe he's going to change change that thinking. Um, with regards to Brown, it's I felt really gutted when the news came through that he was eventually that he was leaving, mm-hmm. and it, it's probably the most gutted I felt this season. It, it, it did feel like the end bumped you. It, I, I thought the end was. Scottish Cup final after that but Brown going is the end uh, I, I now can ha- actually look at it going that is the full stop that, mm-hmm. is the, that is the end of this era Brown leaving and mm-hmm. what, what have Celtic offered Scott Brown we do not know but for me what could we offer Scott Brown a, a year a bit back player and coaching youths Coaching, coaching a development team which is not competitive football, yeah. and he's been and he's been offered a really good level to start his coaching career on a competitive level to start his coaching uh, his coaching career on. So for me, the move to Aberdeen for him was a no brainer as soon as it came up. I think Colin, one of the things. Sorry, sorry Paul, on you go. I was just going to say, I think one of the things about the Scott Brown thing that really interests me is the fact that I think it was only maybe four or five weeks ago he came out and he says. Uh, my future's in my hands here at Celtic. Uh, I could probably go and get a meeting with Lawwell. We could sit down, we could thrash out another contract and I'd still be here next season. Multiple times throughout the season, he kept saying how he was playing his best football of his career. If anybody watched the pre-match build-up to the Scottish Cup final in December, he's totally shrugged off the fact that people were saying, oh, your legs have gone. He just kept saying, no, I'm feeling fit. I'm still as young as I feel. I'm, I'm continuing to offer the best that I can to the club. And I have to say, the game against Rangers the other day was a, a typical Scott Brown performance. I thought he played very well. Um, he's going to have less and less of an impact at Celtic. Um, and obviously he's going to have no impact because he's away next season. But if he was to have stayed, I would have loved to have seen him in that role that we had Tom Boyd and Paul Lambert in um, at the end of the Martin and Neil era when we were ushering in new players. But they were there in the background and they were the person that you could turn to. We're going to be bringing in probably somewhere in the region of 10 to 15 players this summer. Who's the person that they can go to when they're struggling to settle in? Who's the person that can help integrate them into that squad? It would have been Scott Brown that had been there 14 years. Having that experience and just letting it out the door, it's it's a real shame. By all accounts, we did offer him a one-year contract. But I think that stability of the two-year deal and the, the fact that he can prolong his career and get a first step into the coaching ladder at a very decent level, as Kevin says. That must have been really hard for him to turn down. See, the, the other thing there, 
going back to the point you made, Colin, in relation to who do you go to, uh, it's another subject that's come up on a Celtic state of mind, whereby there's been occasions in the club's past where we've let far too much experience out the door, and I'm talking player player-wise, Kev, you look at that great centenary side and that, that was broken up very, very quickly. When you look at the actual experience that we lost from the centenary side, Roy Aiken, Tommy Burns, um, Frank McAvenny, Billy Stark, Mark McGee, all very experienced players. Um, pivotal, the pivotal ones for me were Aiken and Burns. We should never have let the two of their guys go within such close proximity. Um, since then, you could even argue that, you know, the, the likes of Lustig, the aforementioned Craig Gordon, um, you know, that type of experience was something that was so, so important to Celtic. You can't buy it. That's the big thing. You just can't buy that level of experience. And I've asked, well, who are the next in line, Colin? And, you know, the, the players that are obvious to me are James Forrest, uh, Callum McGregor. You've also got a great deal of experience in uh, near Beaton um, and also Lee Griffiths, but I don't think Lee Griffiths could ever be described as a role model for anybody coming in. But it's important to, to probably note, you're talking about the players that are, are leaving and those coming in, Colin. We did a, an Axon special two or three weeks mm-hmm. ago. We went through yep. the entire squad. The top end, the top end, if you're going to be really brutal, was 18 players leaving Celtic. And that, that was from the first team right down to the kind of fringe youth players. 18 mm-hmm. players. And part of my list was near Beaton uh, with a massive question mark around Lee Griffiths so you know I wouldn't expect Beaton to be here next season either uh, Griffiths who knows what's going to happen with, with Lee Griffiths that could leave you with just the two kind of figureheads in terms of the playing side of things in Callum McGregor and James Forrest and again that's a big concern for me because there's going to be so many players coming into the side who you know potentially know not a great deal about Celtic you know, and mm-hmm. what it means to to win every single game, and the mentality that 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 entails. Do you think, as some have suggested, that we've not seen the the last of Scott Brown at Celtic? Do you think that he is destined to come back at some stage in the future? I think it's far too early to say that. I mean, this could go completely tits up for Scott Brown at Aberdeen. <laughs> I, I mean, we we don't know what's there, um, and there's always a point when you see ex-players leave and there's always this clamour for them to come back and a coaching role there's always a clamour for them to come back as a manager um, and you hear people saying every time the job com- becomes available let's bring in Henrik Larsson let's get Henrik Larsson back in striker I want coach Henrik- I- well I'd have him in as a striker coach but I would never have him in as a manager never in a million years would I bring back Henrik Larsson would you have him would you have him before Roy Keane Okay, right. <laughs> and, and that's when I would have him back, right? <laughs> but like, looking back to the point I was about to make, everybody knows how they felt about Neil Lennon towards the end of this season. Some people really took a massive disliking to him. Some people had a lot of sympathy for him, but the fan base was completely split. And as the kind of the season went on and on. It was just a case of, right, it's time to go. He's tarnished his legacy. He's ruined his reputation. This is all quotes that was getting said by fans. Can you imagine the turn of the greatest, or certainly the greatest of my generation to ever pull on the hoops, getting that sort of treatment? Keep Henrik Larsson miles away for that job. Now, a lot of people will see Scott Brown not in the same echelons as Henrik Larsson, but they'll see him as a club legend. And I, I think it's quite hard to argue the point that he isn't because he's played so many games for the club, he's won so many trophies. So then for him to come back and then he maybe doesn't have a great period in charge of Celtic, why ruin your reputation? Well, it goes back... It goes back to that old, um, you know, for me, the, the Irish thing. You know, you bring somebody in because of the Irish connection, bring someone in because of the Celtic connection. Forget that. Bring someone in be- on their credentials. Bring someone in on their ability. And as you say, Colin, we don't know how good a coach he is because he's never done it. So, yeah, he's had uh, a wee bit of experience with the, the kind of younger players at Celtic. But this is this is the acid test for him, isn't it? Going to Aberdeen. Mm-hmm. And as you say, it might not go the way uh, that he wants it to go. There's never any guarantees. But then it leads us on to, right, the announcement's been made. Yeah, he's still the club captain, but we've got a Scottish Cup to win. We've got the fifth in a row Scottish Cup to win. It's the only kind of silver lining on a, a season of disappointment. And yeah, we are also planning for next season. Is it wise to play on week in, week out between now and the end of the season? Would it not be better to have a wee nod to, to the future, Colin, and say, well, it's time to get Sorrow back in his side because Scott Brown's not going to be here? 
I, I, I agree with what you're saying. Um, but what I also think about Scott Brown is he's not going to be thinking ahead to next season. His concentration will still be on wrapping up this season and trying to win the Scottish Cup as a way for him to leave um, on a high of, well, as much of a high as that you can get off of this season. But there is a time that comes where you say, well, who's his replacement? And we've been working on this idea of having a Scott Brown replacement for the last, I don't know, five years or so, the amount of players that we've brought in in those positions. Um, and, some, that, and some who we haven't, like well, John McGinn. Yep. That's that's almost your trigger word is John McGinn, so I was trying I to avoid saying that. Um, but guys like um, Ismail Asoro, who's come in, Kowasi Ibue, there's been different players that we've brought in to try and kind of mould them in the shape of Scott Brown to replace him eventually mm. and it's never really worked Sorrow came in and done really well um, when he came in back sort of October November time but in his last few performances it's just not quite got up to that level and I don't know if that's complacency setting in or if that's really that the standard that we should come to expect of Sorrow, and that's maybe why he wasn't playing for such a long period of time before he was eventually drafted in you've got to kind of see what you can get out of him between now and the end of the season and I think you'll maybe see a rotational basis where the game coming up against Falkirk next weekend I think Sorrow will start but maybe games like if you get as far as the Scottish Cup final when you go to Ibrox I think Scott Brown will still probably play those games Now I'll come over to yourself Kevin on that note um, is it on is it based on the ability and the actual performances that you play Scott Brown or is it too much sentimentality I mean there needs to come a time where you've got to trust Sorrow at Ibrox I mean that that's always the, the kind of thinking right we can we can trust them against Falkirk but when it comes round to Ibrox we need to get Brown back in there well we're not going to have that next season so let's start building the team as much as we possibly can um, around what we're going to have and you know, I'm I'm more of the view that yeah, I thought and I've said Scott Brown was one of the better performers against Rangers last time, last time round. But I've seen some howlers this season from Scott Brown, some really mm-hmm. poor performances. Um, because obviously, when you're watching the game, you're taking notes because we're then speaking about it at half time and full time, Colin. And often I've got big asterisks next to Scott Brown's name four, five, six times in a game because mm-hmm. he's lost the ball in important positions. He's not winning tackles that he used to win. I've never said his legs are gone. I've been a big a big supporter of Scott Brown but following that I just think sentimentality has has done us time and time again and often this season it's done us because we stuck with Neil Lennon far too long he should have been gone he should have been gone you know October at the very very latest and that's when my, my tipping point came Kev what's your thoughts on that uh, b- between now and the end of the season I would I would far more likely use Scott Brown sparingly than Ismail Osorio sparingly Sitting here as a fan, it's easy to say Sorrow should play, all the young laddies should play, everybody that we've got on loan should actually just go back to their clubs and we should be looking to try and get a tune out of the players that are going to be there next season. But then we have no John Kennedy who's actually got eight, nine games to, to mould his future career at whatever club he's going to go to. So Kennedy's going to play at simple, he's going to go to the tried and tested and you are going to see Scott Brown more often than not. Mm -hmm. in the bigger games because it's John Kennedy's call we're talking about Scott Brown going to Aberdeen as well Scott Brown's probably looked at John Kennedy and went I need to get out of here to actually go and prove myself as a coach rather than flatlining here Mm. getting roles here and there I need to go out and prove myself and I've got no worries about Scott Brown he he signed that deal with Aberdeen that'll be parked in the back of his head until he becomes Mm -hmm. an Aberdeen player on the 1st of June yeah we're talking about managers, we're talking about perceptions. Um, now, interestingly enough, if I had said at any point since we started speaking about Neil Lennon leaving Celtic, the names, if I'd uttered the names of two managers, Davey Moyes or Mick McCarthy, I could just imagine the comment section, um, and we will get to you uh, guys and girls on the comment section, I can just imagine the reaction that both of those names would um, spark off. But I think this proves, uh, Kev, that it's, it's got to be substance over profile. I think that's key. You look at the job that Moyes has done at West Ham. Mick McCarthy, interestingly enough, big John Fallon uh, on, face, on our Acts on Facebook group said weeks ago, in fact, before he got the Cardiff job, 
Mick McCarthy would be a shout and not one person um, agreed with him so I think they're two classic examples of it's got to be substance over profile you've got to look at their capabilities I mean look at what's happened with Mick McCarthy there's been some great comments about uh, the clubs that he's left behind Wolves, Zipswich and the Republic Island and we'll get to Ireland in a few moments uh, but are they not two classic examples Kev I mean Davey Moyes was always kind of touted as a future Celtic manager do you think that'll ever happen? I don't think it'll happen not now because I remember one night me and you, Paul, were sitting with, well, I'll go for the first name drop this time. We were sitting with Frank McAvenny and who said he had been playing golf with David Moyes. And this was before, this was just after Brendan Rodgers had left. And he says David Moyes still sees himself as a top five manager in England. Mm. And he had no interest whatsoever of coming for the Celtic job. So what he's done at West Ham is not going to change his opinion of himself. So I, I couldn't see Moyes actually even taking the Celtic job now because yeah. of what he's done with West Ham. Mm-hmm. Um, Mick McCarthy as well. You, I think a lot is to do that they're with unfashionable clubs who have to play a certain style of football to get out of where they are. And I think that... Also, as you say, they're no fashionable. They didn't play. They didn't play t- tiki taka. They didn't actually talk and man and David Brent management speak. They're no. They're, they're no. They're no a uh, Guardiola. They're no a. Uh, um, they would they get an interview in the Athletic. Put it that way. They would get. They would, they would, they would get an interview in Talk Sport. They wouldn't. They wouldn't get. Inter- they would have a twenty minute interview with Jim Wright White rather than getting a six thousand word piece written about them in the Athletic. And I think that's a lot of the problem. It's just perception. Perception is key. Mm-hmm. Um, I mentioned earlier on Martinez. I can confirm that Celtic have not even approached them. And this goes back to the, the Jim Moore comment and Anthony Haggerty actually aim the very very top aim at the very, very top, approach that manager and then work your way down. Because remember we were talking about Ralph Ranić, and we tried to get him on the show um, and then there was the Martinez rumours around Martinez and Maloney uh, when Kevin put me in the spot last October. Who would you have Who would you have if we got rid of Neil Lennon? Um, but Martinez hasn't been asked the question and by all accounts he's not interested anyway. But uh, th- there's an interesting one for you as well. Now, let's talk about one of the jobs that Mick McCarthy left behind and we'll, we'll work this into the, the kind of international roundup, uh, seeing how we're in the, the uh, day two, match day two of a three-game international period. Republic of Ireland, is this, Colin Watt, the worst Irish team in living memory? I mean, I, I go back. I go back to, and there'll be people watching this who are like, "Ah, oh, I remember, you know, pre Jack Charlton." My my Irish memories in terms of the Republic Ireland team, probably similar to Kev, is the Jack Charlton side and what he did with that team and everything that's happened since then. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, in my, certainly in my living memory, this is the worst I've seen Ireland. And I have to apologise to one of our regular contributors in here, Highland Paddy too, who's a massive fan of his national team. But that was the worst performance I've ever seen um, from the Irish side last night. It was absolutely shocking. And Stephen Kenny wants to have a good look at himself. The team that he picked for that last night, that was his B team that he threw on for basically what was a European qualifier. Now, Luxembourg have been kind of going through this period where they've picked up some interesting results. They've beat Azerbaijan, they've beat Cyprus, um, they've beat uh, Montenegro as well. That's Ireland's level now. That's the kind of teams that Ireland have to compete against. And you take a look at that performance last night. It wasn't like it was 1 0, but Luxembourg had chances to make it 2, 3, 4, and Ireland struggled to get any sort of substance. It wasn't until the likes of Shane Long and um, James McLean came on last night before Ireland managed to create anything at all. Uh, you see it in the, the Irish press today. They're saying it's the worst performance they've ever had. And it's World, really World Cup, World Cup sorry, qualifier. World yeah. Cup qualifier, yeah. But it's the worst performance they've ever had, and it's you're going to do well to try and top it. It was absolutely pathetic from them. And, you know, it just carries on from that dreadful run that they're on. I keep going back to the time where Stephen Kenny was at Dunfermline because I've seen him at close quarters um, living in that area. Uh, he was not a popular man around uh, Dunfermline I can tell you that amongst Dunfermline fans and players and uh, I remember speaking to one I don't know if I've told you Kev about the the coaching methods um, of 
Stephen Kenny. The, Dunfermline trained, I don't know if they still do, uh, down at Petrivi. Big, massive playing parks down at Petrivi. And every time they, they kind of broke off for a wee chat or a team talk, uh, Stephen Kenny would take them away from the grass area. If, if anyone's ever played at Petrivi, because all the, the youth football teams and boys clubs and all that played in there, there's a, there's a huge kind of wooded um, park which breaks the, the motorway from the parks and he would take them down to certain trees and give his team talks under the trees but you'd need to walk like 300 yards to get to the trees so eventually one of the, the more senior pros says you know Gaffer why are we walking to the trees and he explained how the oxygen levels underneath the tree makes people um, retain more information so whenever he was doing a team talk he would take them under the trees and you can just imagine all these guys looking at each other thinking what on earth are you talking about he, he definitely lost it to dressing room there was a few other examples but then speaking to Paddy McCourt who was with Stephen Kenny at Derry City I mean he ranks them right up there we were one of the best managers stroke coaches that he's ever worked with. It's certainly not working at the Republic of Ireland. And again, it shines a light on just how good a job Mick McCarthy did there, Kevin Graham. Maybe there's better air quality in Derry than what there is in Dunfermline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm next to that kind of, you're next to that busy road, let's be honest. <laughs> Aye, Mick McCarthy, I mean, that, that was two goals that he had at the Republic of Ireland job. I remember when we were getting all these young lads here, Leo Connors, your Afiobis and that from Ireland, we were told that the Kenny and McCarthy were getting transitioned because Kenny had worked with the younger generation who mm-hmm. were meant to be a top Irish generation that were coming through. And, and I never saw any of the game last night, so I find it bemusing that, as Colin says, it's a B team that he threw, that, that he threw out and they were, they were beaten off Luxembourg. But I think, again, Ireland just need to maybe double down. If they believe in Stephen Kenny, then going, going to, a, for example, a Neil Lennon type, if they're going to need to try and build a young side, bringing in a, a Neil Lennon type is not going to work for them. Um, look, McCarthy done his job. He got Ireland to major tournaments. He got them to qualify from groups in major tournaments. I think, I might be wrong, near 2002. He fell out with Roy Keane in 2002. Mm. Um, and he's still, he's, still, he's still in work just now. So, again, it's just perception with Mick, with Mick McCarthy. But Stephen Kenny... I mean, I remember Paddy McCourt saying that that night, eh? Mm-hmm. So, again, it's just the collection of individuals you've actually got. If they're going to listen to somebody like Stephen Kenny, if they're going to listen to somebody like Neil Lennon, if they're going to listen to somebody like Roberto Martinez, it's a, it's how you actually, it's all about man management, ain't it? It's about how about all you handle the, 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 the dressing room. Now, we've been talking about perception, and I've got to bring this up from Earthy Castle. Uh, going back to the time we brought Brian McClare to Oakley, Kev. Uh, Oakley, the dogs still roam about in gangs here. Yeah, <laughs> they do. So, so, so do the rats. So do the rats. Um, but you know what? All my family still live out in the villages, so it's great. It's always great. There's a brilliant bit. If you're driving from Dunfermline, like if you were to head towards Kincardin, right, you basically drive past all the villages, right, from, you know, Kearney Hill all the way through Cross Fords and you get your Carnock and Oakley and Blair Hall. And there's a there's a, a kind of community hall in Oakley on the left-hand side, right, and if you're driving along the road, don't ask me the name of the roads, I survive on Satnav. And there's like a, there's a wee folly, there's, there's one of the towers on the right-hand side, that's the road I'm talking about. And on the left-hand side, there's a community hall and sprayed on the wall, since the 1970s, and this will appeal to Kevin Graham, and it's still there, and I need to get a picture of it before it gets uh, renovated, is status quo, spray-painted on the wall. That's the graffiti you get in Oakley. There you go. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> when was the last time you were there, Kev? Because I know you're a big status quo fan. 1970s. Oh, I, I never <laughs> spray-painted status quo uh, in Oakley, definitely. I've only been in Oakley once, and that was to watch you playing football. That Celtic Greats game, eh? And I just, when you started mentioning, you said you drive past all the villages, I thought you were going to start singing Dignity with Deacon Blue. I, just, <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's where you were gone there, eh? But. No, not quite, not quite. Now, he's a Dundee United fan, isn't he? Ricky Ross. He's a Dundee United man. Uh, so, we're talking about international football, and obviously, uh, there's quite a few Celts involved. Our very own Scotty Allcroft uh, managed to get Chris Ayer's jersey at the Gibraltar game. How quality was that? And in true Scotty Allcroft fashion, he just wore it to the boozer the following night. Match-worn jersey. 
He's out having a swally. Brilliant. Um, but of course, we've got we've got the, the Celts playing for Scotland, but we've also got Stevie Clark. Stevie Clark, who's got connections to Celtic, obviously, through his uncle, who played for Celtic um, as part of the, the very early Quality Street. Um, Clark's been asked before would he ever come to Glasgow and he's made it quite clear that that's not in his kind of plans particularly for his family uh, with the Glasgow sides certainly not with the national team but his name keeps cropping up I mean uh, when do you look at his style of football Colin is that something that would excite you as a Celtic fan? I don't think right away it would but if it brings success that would tell its own story and I know you said there that um, Stevie Clark's repeatedly um, said that he wouldn't be interested in a job on either side of Glasgow. But then only about two or three weeks ago, he was interviewed and said that he would never rule himself out for the job to suggest that maybe his mindset is changing. And if that opportunity was available to him, then he might jump at it. Whether he's involved in this sort of short list that we've been told is there of managers, I don't know. I think if he goes to the Euros, he'll probably have one eye on trying to qualify for the World Cup as well. I think he really enjoys the aspect of international football um, and certainly the job that he's done for Scotland has been fantastic watching that Scotland game the other night um, seeing the difference in the team over the last few years was really impressive um, and I, I, I hasten to say it because it's your trigger word but John McGinn's goal, the overhead kick was something that you just don't expect from somebody that's in a Scotland jersey um, and the fact that he's managing to get good performances out of players that we would probably say are at best average players. Guys like Stephen O'Donnell, guys like Jack Hendry, Grant Hanley came in and it was a Hanley and um, Hendry combination at the back and it was Mm. actually pretty impressive. So the fact that you can get something out of players is something that we've not seen. Under Neil Lennon we saw a lot of players deteriorate. If Steve Clark can get the best out of some of these players then that's a, a, a something that kind of ticks in his favour but I don't think we'll ever see him as a Celtic manager if I'm honest When you're looking at the the talent I mean it does you, you mentioned a couple of kind of unfashionable players and I think um, there are certain players within the, the defence who might be described as unfashionable but when you look at the crop of talent and you want to talk about Tierney, Robertson, McTominay, McGinn, McGregor, Forrest isn't there at the moment but then you've got another crop, another wave coming through and Alexei Turnbull, Billy Gilmer and, and others you know coming through, you've got Lewis Ferguson, there's others coming through. Um, I think Stevie Clark will look at that Colin and he'll say you know what I could be here for Listen, let's call it a golden generation because what is a golden generation for Scottish football when we haven't qualified for anything for over 20 years? Well, we've already qualified and he's got a crop of young players coming through. Now, you know, English uh, media and and pundits are always falling over themselves to to label their team the golden generation. Why don't we do it? Because I'll tell you what, that is some crop of talent coming through. Uh, The Mm -hmm. one thing that always concerns me about Scotland is the strikers. We we never seem to get a a right good goal-scoring striker, but you've reminded me a few things. Kevin, I'm going to come to you. Overhead kicks by Scotland players. One that went in, one that didn't. I'm going to talk about the one that didn't. I can't wait you've gone with us. <laughs> Sam, salmon, salmon in blue, Scotland jersey. Mm-hmm. The very underused Scotland jersey, overhead kick against Germany. Or was it West Germany? No, it would have been Germany. Um, now, how do you remember that goal? I'm going to ask you the question. How do you remember that, that, that overhead kick, rather? It wasn't a goal. How do you remember it, though? I remember that. What the... stopped it from going in? Oh... I can't actually remember what stopped it going in, but I do remember the 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 press reaction to it that mm-hmm. we had just seen the greatest Scottish striker since Dennis Law and Kenny Douglas introduce himself in the international scene because he hit the bar with a corner kick, was it? The, there you go, there yeah, you go, right. Bar, right. He hit the bar with an overhead kick. He didn't actually, right? But this is the, one of the Mandela moments because I remember him hitting the bar, Kev. You remember him hitting the bar. The goalie saved it. Ah. Now, ah, now, I'm talking about the Mandela moment because there's people out there who remember a, a news report that Nelson Mandela had died when he was in prison. Right? There's people who would put their mortgage and swear on their, their family's lives that this happened, and then obviously it didn't. But these people think it did, and it's called the Mandela effect. right? So there's all these things that for some reason in your head, Kev, and in my head, I see Duncan Ferguson hitting the bar. Goal, he saved it. The goal, he saved it. Check it on YouTube. He didn't hit the bar. The other one, Kev... I'll let you mention this one. Overhead kick. Wee Mo. 
Ah, you're against France. Wee more. Yeah. Uh, uh, now that, that was some overhead kick. And by the way, I remember buying the shoot magazine the following week, mm-hmm. right? Because it was around about that time. And it uh, had a picture I'm doing overhead kick, middle pages, Celtic and Scotland. Mm-hmm. Celtic That's and Scotland right. and we all know what happened after that moving <laughs> swiftly on moving swiftly on now um, there's a good interesting me point coming in from Colin Mackay hi guys didn't know you were on a Sunday superb well what we do Colin is uh, Axom a Celtic state of mind uh, obviously goes out as a bulletin six days a week so on the day that Celtic are not playing at the weekend, we tend not to go out. But when it's like an international weekend, we try and get together at least one of the days so that we've still got the six bulletins a week. On match day, especially th- during the, the week, if it's a midweek game, we've got our pre-match, our half-time and our post-matches. So we've got three um, broadcasts all around the game and we also have the bulletin during the day. So on a midweek match day, we go out four times in one day. So over the period of a year, We've gone out every single day. Actually, we've gone out more than once a day uh, over the period of a year. It's all free. You get a lot of the, ch- uh, the the content exclusively on YouTube. So if you're watching on YouTube, get subscribing. But this gives me a wee opportunity because I've got to chuckle from time to time. I keep a wee eye on all these things uh, because you want to make sure that people are enjoying the channel. And to be fair, um, over the last probably six months, a Celtic State of Mind have been in the top 20 of the, the UK iTunes chart. Now, that's not an easy thing to get uh, to that level so thanks everybody for tuning in Um, but I mean you're up there with the official Manchester United podcast you're up there with the official Leeds United podcast Um, some of the athletic guys are in there Kev your pal that runs the arse blog is always in the top kind of 10 open goal uh, Jimmy Bullard Robbie Fuller so we're right up there and that's down to people listening in and this is where I'm going with this because I find to get to that point it takes a lot of hard work Colin a lot of effort from the contributors and from the team Um, and what then happens is people who um, like to comment but not live go away somewhere else and make their feelings known amongst their wee um, sewing group their wee knitting group on their fans forums and then they have a wee bitching session about how Colin Watt doesn't know what he's talking about and Paul John Dykes doesn't know what he's talking about and all this kind of stuff and what I would say to these people Right, is don't go back to your wee echo chamber with your yeah, your wee knitting group, right? But actually make the comments live. If you disagree with what we're saying, make them live. Let's have a discussion. That's the whole beauty of it, Colin Watt. Rather than going away and, you know, actually watching the, the content, then going somewhere else to comment on it, just comment live or get onto one of our social media pages and disagree with us then. We're not always right. You know, that's the beauty of it, Colin. And sometimes when I'm talking to contributors or when I read the comments, it completely changes my view, completely changes my view. So fair play to everybody for getting involved. I love the debate. I love people disagreeing with us and giving us their take on it. Um, And as well as being in the top 20 fairly regularly, like over the last six months, um, we, in terms of Celtic-related videos on our YouTube channel, are outperforming Celtic Football Club. The views that we're getting, the audience that we're getting is bigger on a Celtic state of mind than on Celtic FC's YouTube channel. So massive thank you to all the contributors and massive thank you for everybody that's tuning in as well, Kevin. How does that make you feel having been part of episode one almost four years ago, Kevin Graham? I know it's quite it's quite astounding that where we've got to, especially when I know for a fact that I didn't ken what I'm talking about. Eh? So <laughs> they actually still <laughs> been they actually still been here. Um, as, as I, I thank my lucky stars every day that I haven't been found out yet. <laughs> Kevin, to the contrary, you've got your own show now on a Tuesday night and it's Scream Celica. Um And this is how we've kind of developed it. Colin Watts got his own Wednesday show, uh, the Football Insomniac, called the, the Top Football Stories uh, from the World of Soccer that Keep You Awake at Night. We've got Amy Canavan with Soccer Supernova. There's various other shows in the mix and being developed. But what always amuses me, and this amused me when my books came out um, as reviews uh, and I used to get really upset about reviews especially when they didn't say Paul Dykes reminds me of Oscar Wilde um, <laughs> if you get like a, a one star a one star review uh, I used to cry myself to sleep now I don't I'm going to be honest with you I love feedback feedback's brilliant it's an important part of developing things but the latest one I noticed um, I think it's on iTunes one star review Kevin Axom 
Right, having listened to 40 minutes of the 3rd of March, and I don't know who presented that one, it was probably me, of the 3rd of March show, um, Axom is not what I remember it to be when I used to listen to it as a weekly podcast. Right, now that was over a year ago that it was a weekly podcast. Since then we've given out free content every single day and this person listens to 40 minutes of it and gives you one star. That's what you're up against. That's what you're up against, right? They ignore everything else you've done, but see that 40 minutes, didn't you like what Colin said about Brendan Rogers? So, nah, you're getting a one star. So anybody that's out there who wants to support the channel, subscribe to us on YouTube, give us a, a decent rating, wherever you watch us, whatever your app is, retweet, like, share, all that kind of stuff, but because it's a community. Axom, it's a community, isn't it? And, you know, it's coming together. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, where I used to cry myself to sleep, I now just laugh at uh, the bad reviews, Colin. I just looked at the 3rd of uh, March. That was a Wednesday. That was me. Oh. So. <laughs> Kevin, your job's safe, mate. Your job's safe. Um, <laughs> that so was not deliberate. Right, Kev. You're right, that was not deliberate. You're safe, Kev. <laughs> You're safe, Kev. Colin, you better watch yourself, son. Um, now, a, Colin... Sorry to jump in there. There, there was a comment there just early, earlier up that, he's, that, that they're saying that you only put up, put up comments you agree with, Paul. I can you want to disagree with that. But there was also another comment. <laughs> uh, I, there was also another comment about the amount of Rangers fans that listen to this and talk about us. And we know that there is a whole load of Rangers fans listen to us because we get told, my next door neighbour tells me, he works on building sites and the Rangers fans love us, love me. Me and probably the Celtic fans on the side. So is that a good or a bad thing? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't really care. When we're twenty points ahead at this point next season, with Roy Keane in charge, that'll maybe change right enough, eh? But that's hey, listen, just for the, just for the crack, man. Let's just get the, <laughs> give Roy Keane the job. I mean, well, it, it'll be a, it's going to be a laugh. When it comes to comments, when it comes to comments, um, no, I don't think I do because I like to disagree with them as well. I like to bring comments up and say, well. I don't disagree. I don't agree with that. And I don't have my favourites, which is something else that someone's levied at me recently. You've got your favourites, your top three. Uh, not at all. Not at all. But what you've got to realise is if you get in early, you make a point, uh, you're going to get shown probably first because another 10 people might make that same point during the show. Mm -hmm. But if you're in first, it's more likely to be seen. But Paul Boyle makes a good point. Keen for the island job. Aye, bash on. Absolutely. Aye. Aye. <laughs> Happy Aye. with that. Happy Aye. with that. Aye. Aye. Yep. <laughs> Colin, you, you used to do a, a regular thing for the website because we do also have axom.net um, which Laura Bradburn's going to take ownership of um, moving forward but you used to do a thing with the Lone Watch and you were always quite impressed with Jack Aitchison but interestingly mm -hmm. enough he left who did he give the interview to? Was it Glasgow's Green? Was it the gig pod? He, he done one recently Hi. and he spoke about the, the trouble around progression at Celtic and I find it interesting that Cameron Harper's made similar comments in the last few days it's a big thing we talk about on a regular basis around youth development at Celtic Park we're at the, si the situation now where we are producing players we're not saying that I mean, we're producing players. You look at the players Celtic have aged 18, 19, well, let's say from 16 to 19, and they're as good as anywhere else in British football. And that's why so many other teams are coming in for them. Kevin, I, I know that you knew the family, one of the boys that went to Bayern Munich. There's been a few boys going to Bayern Munich, Liverpool, Manchester City, Blackburn Rovers. Um, Angelini looks as though he's going to Liverpool he's as well. He's going to Brighton. He's going to Brighton. He going, he's going to Brighton. There you go. Yeah. So these clubs are offering them potentially a better pathway, a better gateway to first-team competitive football. Now, there's only so much Celtic can do about that uh, at this moment in time because of the way you know the Scottish game is set up, Colin. So what are our options now? What do we do? I mean, at the moment, what we've got, we've, we've no reserve league and it's never returning because that's a financial thing that other clubs will not take the burden of the cost behind the reserve league. You know, that, that's the whole reason it was broken up. The Colts, every time the argument of bringing the Colts in, is brought to the table, it's lambasted by other clubs. Yeah. It's, so what, what is the answer? I, I mean, Celtic are every bit as much to blame for this than the setup of the, the football league, the setup of the reserve league. We're not giving these boys a chance. I mean, take a look at the last couple of people that went out on loan over the last few weeks. Guys like Luke O'Connell, Ryan Mullen, Ewan Henderson, and uh, Ewan Otu. Why, why is there not an opportunity for these guys to show what they've got between now and the end of the season? There's By the way, O2, I don't know if you tuned in on Friday night, the Clyde boys were on 
on a state of mind. Yep. Uh, it's the official Clyde podcast, by the way, and some of the guests they've had on has been brilliant. I mean, last week they had Danny Lennon followed by Alan Moore. So they had the manager and the assistant manager in one week. But uh, they were talking about uh, the young boy O2. And he got the man of the match in his debut. He's a fantastic young talent coming through. He's really, really highly thought of. He can sort of play in the, the centre defensive position or step up into the centre defensive mid. Um, a big kind of lump of a boy who I don't think would be out of place if you put him up into the first team between now and the end of the season. Why, why are these guys not even getting anywhere near the bench? Uh, we've got the chance to bring on five substitutes every game. You see a young Adam Montgomery has now been put forward to be the sort of designated left back on the bench because of the injury to, to Greg Taylor and mm -hmm. then I don't think we'll see him between now and the end of the season either and that's a striker that we've converted into a left back he was a centre forward all the way through we've done another Calvin Miller the amount of boys that have went out on loan this season guys like Scott Robertson who have done fantastically well Leo Connor um, and then you get other ones that's out there I don't know if anyone caught the Dunfermline Dundee game yesterday but you get Kerr McEnroy, um, you've also got Ewan Henderson who went out there, and Jonathan Afalabi. Now, I'm not saying that these guys would do any sort of impact in the first team, but now that the league's over, this would have been the perfect opportunity to see what you've got. And then when the new manager comes in, he can decide, well, right, we need to send you back out on loan again, or actually, here's your place in the pre-season squad. Go and impress me and get yourself on the bench for next season. But instead, these guys have went out on loan just to get game time. Why couldn't they have got that between now and the end of this season? Well, it's been an issue that's uh, been ongoing for some time. And I obviously speak to some of the guys that are involved with Harrington. So they're in the seventh tier of Scottish football. Uh, we've also had Danny Lennon in here from Clyde and he's just taken on one of the Celtic youth players. So there's, there are um, different opinions in relation to this because I remember also speaking to Mikey Mikhevich, who was the general manager at Dunfermline, where they were discussing a, a link-up uh, between Celtic and Dunfermline, whereby you know we would give them three or four players of that out, Colin. I'm not talking about kids. Because, I mean, at 17 or 18, are you even a kid? I mean, no, you should be playing at a level. 17, 18 years of age, you should be playing at a level of competitive football. In Scotland, we don't have that. So what about link-ups? Because I think what you've seen, obviously, from the Scottish Cup, and we'll get onto that in a few minutes, what you've seen, Kevin Graham, is that you know some of the lower levels of Scottish football are still competitive enough where you would get better um, football and you would learn more, certainly at that level, than playing other 17-year-old kids in bounce games up at Lennox Town. So, you know, I'm not saying that the answer is to send all your kids to the 6th and 7th tier of Scottish football because I think Jim Orr was dead against that because he thinks it might ruin the players. But competitive football surely is better than what they're getting at the moment. There's some, there's some players not playing football for six months at a time. Now, they're going to stagnate. And when they are thrown into the side, as they were in January, unexpectedly, they didn't look anywhere near the standards, some of them. I'm not writing them all off. But would the answer be, if you don't get the, the coach team and we know the reserves are never coming back, do you have partnerships? Do you have these clubs, three or four clubs, and you can send three or four players every single season to them for competitive football? Is that the answer, Kevin? Or what about a transatlantic situation? And, you know, transatlantic leagues are, are back, um, cross-border leagues are back in the news because it's happening. You know, in principle, there's an agreement between the Netherlands and Belgium. It's helping and it's happening elsewhere. How about setting up something in terms of youth football first, where clubs like Celtic can send their teams to play competitive football with clubs down south? And I don't mean just a bounce one-off friendly game. Get part of a competition. I mean, remember the next gen season uh, series that was set up partly by Mark Warburton, strangely enough, mm -hmm. where they were playing teams like Sport and Lisbon. They were playing competitive football. Kevin, what's the answer to this? I think the answer is. You, you spoke about the next gen C series there, which was great. It was the Champions League. Whoever you got in your Champions League group here, under 21s or development squad played them. That's where we first came into contact with Edward uh, when he when he scored for PSG against us. Something like that would work. Um, what I'm seeing with a lot of the fans of the lower league clubs is they don't want the cold teams there because they reckon it could damage the loan system. The guys like Clyde getting the, the boy that they've got from Celtic on loan, sorry, I forgot his name there. Uh, Otto. Otto, uh, 
going there would actually stop because he would be playing for the Celtic Colts. Um, I can understand that, and I can understand that they maybe don't want, like, the fans. The chairman will want two or 3,000 of their crowd turning up towards Celtic Colts because that will happen. Mm -hmm. If Celtic are playing at Broadwood or a stadium round about here, I would go, I'm going to watch Celtic this afternoon Mm -hmm. if Celtic were playing on a Sunday. I would go and watch the Celtic Colts. I would take my daughter and my son in that. Mm -hmm. So there would be a a revenue generator, but then a lot of the fans of these smaller clubs might just see it as as just a slap in the face in us. But we're in, we're in a post-COVID world or whatever the new normal is going to be. Um, and these clubs are going to need the money. And I'm sure all these chairmen will be actually, even though they've got complaints from fans, all these chairmen will be going, I'm putting my hand up, I want 2,000 coming through my gate. Yep. To, 100% Kevin, aye, definitely. I mean, the, the money that they'll have lost over the last 12 months is the, the only kind of idea that brings in that sort of revenue back in. As you said, you'd take your kids along. Uh, I mean, Celtic used to play their reserve games at Capital, and that was a Monday afternoon at like 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and you still had crowds of about 500 people going to those games. So the, there would be a, a sort of appetite for those kind of games. I'm going to throw a team out here, though, for an affiliation link-up, and there's a Celtic connection here. Um, so just want to get your points on it. Queen's Park... Queen's Park, a team that have had a lot of heavy investment over the last season or so Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously they've got the connection that they're going to try and get through the leagues and they've got the money there. They're probably the only team that could have afforded the part of Luke O'Connell's wages that they're now paying. Do you think Queen's Park could be the team that we end up sending a lot of these players to next season? It really depends on how they see their development. eh? They might see taking players from Celtic and Rangers occasionally as part of the development, or they could have a look at the Gretna situation where Gretna signed, can I remember the boy's name, Winger Dunferm and Livingston, David Bigham. They signed David Bigham from Livingston, who were in the Premier Division at the time, and Mm -hmm. he went down to Gretna, who were, Mm -hmm. I think it was uh, the third division at that point. So it really depends on how Queen's Park see themselves developing with regards to what Paul says I reckon there's probably is a couple of unofficial and you've got the Neil Lennon air quotes now uh, there is a couple of unofficial deals like that under the table you've seen a lot of your players go to Dundee and you see a lot of your players go to Alawa you see a lot of your players go to Dunfermline so we've probably already got unofficial link ups with some sides um, at that level I agree I want a cross border league I want a cross-border competitive league. Um, so we would be playing teams, under-23 teams from England at a higher level. But again, whatever it needs to be, it has to be development. That's a problem. And it has to be competitive. That's a problem. That's why guys like Barry Hepburn, Liam Morrison and that have went to Munich. Because there's no progress between signing a professional contract at Celtic at 16 until you're 20. And by the time you're 21, 22, you're getting punted out on loan to your Dundee's, your Dunfermline clubs like that. And there's no progression. And it's a problem with Scottish football. How many good talents have we lost between 17 and 18, 17 and 20? Because they haven't had competitive games. Yep. And I think a lot of the problem this season has come down to the fact that we are living under the conditions that we're living in. I think if there was if if this was just a, a normal period of time and people were allowed to travel, you would see Celtic going abroad to Germany to play the Bayern Munich B team. You'd see Celtic going abroad to play teams in France and Germany, just in the similar kind of setup that Brentford had done, where they've got a B and C team that go deliberately to other countries to play against these teams to do that same sort of idea. Okay, it's kind of glorified friendlies, but they're playing against these top-level guys that are coming through in Europe. As you mentioned before, Kev, that's where we first saw Edward. Now, if Celtic go away to play a a Marseille or they go away to play a a Bayer Leverkusen, there might be a a young 17, 18-year-old that catches the idea. But in the same sense, you're also testing your own guys against that level of quality. Mm, absolutely uh, there, there has to be a change because otherwise you know we are uh, putting two and a half million pounds I think the last figure was I've seen into youth development and all that money and all the development and all the, the product of that youth the fruits of your labour are going elsewhere 
And that can't continue. I mean, it's been happening for far too long. So, you know, we're hoping that part of the rebuild, part of the, the new football department will focus on the youth development. I'm sure it will. Um, another wee question for you guys, and we're in the international, uh, we're in the realms of international football. Uh, one player who is playing, uh, who's out on loan is Jack Hendry. Another one who isn't playing is uh, Olivier in Cham. <laughs> These are two guys who would be classed as first team players, and I'm not going to use the air quotes because Kevin's already done it. First team players. Uh, there's others out there. There's a few young guys, as you've mentioned, Colin. You've also got Bio and Sved. <laughs> um, big talking point during the week was all around Hendry. Oh, he's still not good enough for Celtic. My point would be that may be so, but how can we do that without assessing him? You know, mm-hmm. um, will it just be a case of right? We're going to take a couple of million quid from because that's the, the fee that they're talking around. Um, going for him to go to Belgium permanently, they've got first refusal on him. There's interest from Germany. There's in, in, interest from England. Mm-hmm. So, um, what happens with these players? I don't see a future for Incham. Again, no. is that perception on my part? Uh, but I look at Hendry. He didn't look like a Celtic player when he when he played. Um, I think there was a real crisis of confidence, and the best thing that could have happened is he went out on loan and he's went and proved himself. Can he be like one of these players, like your Christie McGregor, um, Ayer, who can come back, Colin Watt, and do a job for Celtic, or do we cut our losses? Do we get our two million pound and do we look elsewhere? I think Celtic will make the move to sell him on. Um, he only has 12 months left on his deal when he comes back. So that's the sort of make or break decision where it's the last chance you're going to get to get some sort of money for him. He could probably. His stock, his stock's at his highest. He's back in the yeah. international team. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I know there's, I think there's a, a fee involved for a sort of um, obligation to buy um, that his team in Belgium has to take him at the end of this season. And by all accounts, the, the Belgian football podcast that reached out to us yesterday um, says that they are looking to take take that up, but they're waiting to see who the new manager of Celtic will be. So, mm. I, I mean, I, I thought he played pretty well for Scotland the other night. Um, the, the two goals that Scotland conceded, one of them was an outstanding header um, from the boy up front. Um, the other one probably could have done slightly better from, but I mean, it wasn't as if it was like a kind of case of he's always making mistakes alongside Hanley as well. I thought they actually played some decent football. He's good on the ball. His passing was quite impressive. But I mean, in the scenario that we find ourselves in, we're going into next season, and there's just a point you brought up here. We could potentially get into next season with only Stephen Welsh as our centre half. Yeah, if Chris Iron moves on. That, that was the, the biggest uh, concern really when we looked through the squad, Colin, was the defensive scenario. So right back, um, once all the loanies go back, all we have is John Joe Kenny uh, right back because, I mean, Ralston was one of the players that we reckoned... Uh, sorry, the only player we're going to have is Ralston because John Joe Kenny's going to go back to, to Everton. So your right back's uh, Tony Ralston, your left back's Greg Taylor. You're, there's no backup. Absolutely mm-hmm. no backup. And when you look at the centre half, Julie ends out to September October time. So your only centre half, if you're you're not going to include Beaton in that that equation, Kev, your only centre half is Stephen Welsh. If indeed you let Jack Kendry go, so I, I take on board what you're saying. Jack Kendry's stock's never going to be higher, is it? You know he's performing well at Belgium. He's in the Scotland team. Do we just get the two million pound and move on, or does he come back to Celtic and we probably buy another couple of centre halves? And he probably is near first pick by the end of the season. By which time his contract runs down and it's worthless. So I can see why we would move him on, but at the same time, two centre halves at least are an absolute priority, Kevin. But we've we've looked at the the squad in some detail, and it's a massive rebuilding uh, job. I can't find a comment, but the latest lookalike came in today as well, and I must say I don't I don't for a minute. Uh, take this as an insult because Robocop was one of my favourite movies <laughs> as a kid and uh, apparently I look like the guy but we're here but everybody knows it's a wig I wear anyway but Robocop not you can call me Robocop any day you want you know what I mean what a film that was your move creep I don't know who it was that said it but uh, welcome to the show uh, anyway uh, the lookalikes listen I've not seen any you know that when I go for a haircut an illegal haircut I ask for a Leanne Dempster now so I've not seen any whatsoever that, that actually upset me 
None at all. Not even Gash. Gash Nesbitt. So there we go. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved in the 12.30 bulletin. We will be back tomorrow. Kevin Graham's uh, Monday, but we'll confirm if Kevin is going to be there. Uh, he's shaking his head, so we were going to have to... I'm going to say something here. We're going to have to replace him. Is he replaceable? Who knows? Um, maybe I'm going to have to take the hot seat. <laughs> Everybody's replaceable, Paul. Even Scotland. Uh, uh, well there you go there you go it's been an absolute pleasure today not, not a dull moment no filler whatsoever and uh, I'm just going to go back and watch the 3rd of March uh, and make some notes for Colin for his appearance on Wednesday um, thanks everybody for getting involved as I said before keep supporting us this is a community you're helping us to build get subscribing to YouTube give us uh, reviews preferably not one star reviews if you've only watched 40 <laughs> minutes in the last year um, retweet us share us do all, all of the things that uh, makes Axon grow uh, because we are going out every single day even when we get back to the games we'll find out a way of doing that I'm not quite sure if it's going to be um, in a van outside the ground but we'll do something that's for sure uh, but all that's left for me to say Colin what Kevin Graham on a Sunday afternoon thanks again for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind 